So up next, we've got 3D printing legs with Saul and Tito. Do you guys want to jump in and grab that? Yeah, absolutely. So that was a great session. Um, and now I'm excited to, to tell you guys about 3D printing and prosthetics uh, with this interview that we did with a leader in the field. Uh, but before we do that, we're going to do a quick little poll. Um, who here has ever used a 3D printer before? Or if you don't know what a 3D printer is, you can answer that as well. And if at any point during this interview you have any questions, please feel free to post those questions in the chat and I'll do my best to address them as the interview continues. Uh, at the last five minutes of the session, we'll have some time to sort of have a dialogue if there's questions that you feel might be easier said rather than typed in, or if you have any sort of comments or questions about what you see in the video. Um, great, okay. So I'll give it a few more seconds here for the poll. Um, but yeah, this is, I think, is going to be a pretty exciting uh, interview for you guys to see, talking about working in the developing world, uh, 3D printing and prosthetics. Uh, so let's see how we're feeling about our exposure to using 3D printers before. Let's share these results. So most of you have used a 3D printer before, which is really great to see. Uh, when I was in middle school, I didn't even know 3D printing existed. I only learned about it in high school, so that's pretty awesome. Uh, and everybody seems to know what a 3D printer is, so that's a really great start. Um, so without further ado, Tito, if you'd like to take over and uh, share your screen with the video. Hi there, welcome to the 3D printing leg session of National Biomechanics Day at Carnegie Mellon University. This session is a pre-recorded interview with Jerry Evans, the CEO and president of NIA Technologies, which is a Canadian nonprofit that, among other things, 3D prints legs. Uh, now we'll go on to the interview. Alrighty, well, thanks for joining us, Jerry. Can you tell us a little bit about what is NIA Technologies and what are the problems that you're trying to address? Thank you. So NIA Technologies is a uh, Canadian nonprofit technology company. We work on healthcare technology and principally prosthetics and orthotics. We were organized in 2015 by uh, Hope and Healing, which is a charity. And our principal uh, work takes place in low-income countries where we support the inexpensive production of prosthetics and orthotics for principally for children with disabilities. And we've had the good fortune of being involved with uh, a number of key players, people that have helped us along the way, certainly Hope and Healing, the charity that I mentioned, the University of Toronto, Autodesk Research. And we've been uh, fortunate enough to, to uh, receive funding from a, a bunch of really notable organizations like Grand Challenges Canada, Google, Autodesk, and, and other donors. You asked about you know, what is the problem that we're trying to solve? Well, it's, it's quite simply this, that in any given year, there are, you know, something on the order of 38 million people in the world that need a prosthetic orthotic device to help them walk. And there's a worldwide shortage of about 40,000 trained pr practitioners in this space. And so as a result of that shortage, only about 10% of the individuals that require a prosthetic or orthotic device actually get one. So shortage of trained practitioners. Many of these are children that do not receive these mobility devices that they need. They're, they tend to be in low to middle income countries and they suffer you know, greatly from not being able to be mobile. They cannot play with other kids. They tend to not be able to go to school. They miss out on life opportunities, work and so forth. And as a result, they generally experience uh, poor health and often remain you know, in that cycle of poverty. It just carries on. Wow. Well, that seems like really important work. Uh, so you mentioned a term that I think some people might have heard before, but maybe there's some discrepancies in what they think it means and what it actually means. Can you tell us what is a prosthetic device? Sure. So here's a prosthetic uh, device. I'm going to try and show it in the screen. I'm trying to get it in the screen. There. So this is a, um, uh, a below the knee prosthetic uh, device that would fit a person that has an amputation below the knee. On the screen, you see a number of different types of prosthetics. Generally speaking, a prosthetic is some sort of artificial replacement to a body part. It can, it can be a tooth, uh, it can be a bone uh, inside the body, or it can be in, the, in this case, uh, a, a leg, an arm and so forth. And it is, as I say, to replace a, a part of the body that is not working or that is missing. They can be of two types, basically. One is a functional one. So uh, as you can see in some of these photos, 
uh, that are on the screen. Uh, there is some ability to, for example, this bionic hand uh, to be able to, to do things, manipulate the hand. In other cases, they're, they're static uh, devices like this limb that I was showing. And uh, sometimes it's cosmetic. Uh, in the case of this hand, you can see this replica hand is, is, is a very good replica of the, the, the person's actual hand. Mm -hmm. And um, so two different uh, broad types, uh, functional and cosmetic. Great. And so what does a getting a prosthetic device sort of enable a person to do that they would otherwise struggle to do? So, um, as I said, we, we work on children principally, or that's that's the uh, cohort that we try and help the most. And um, so children are particularly, it, it affects their life in, in, a, in, a, in a very large way in that over the course of a life, a child, for example, missing a prosthetic limb uh, will require 25 devices in their lifetime. So take Roslyn. I, I'm going to show a little bit of a video here in just a minute. And Roslyn is profiled there. Rosalind here, four years old, uh, was born without a limb. And um, she, as I mentioned, is, we, we were told that she's excluded from play with other kids. She, she has not been able to go to school. And as a result, she will have that downstream uh, you know, issues with her, with her life and missing out on opportunities and being mobile and getting to work and so forth. So increasing her mobility and giving her an artificial limb will increase her ability to manage daily activities and you know, give her greater independence and confidence. So it has a ripple effect in her life. Yeah, it seems really impactful to be able to have sort of the ability to do these other activities. So what generally makes a good prosthetic? Well, you know, Two things. One, it has to be comfortable. Um, you know, kind of broad characteristics. It has to be comfortable, otherwise the the uh, the patient, the client, will not wear it. And it has to provide that mobility. So it has to be good for for getting around, helping the patient to get around. Mm -hmm. So they must fit well, not only for comfort, but but um, they also need to fit well because the in the case of a prosthetic limb that is a, a lower limb prosthetic, it has to bear the weight of the patient, it has to bear the weight of the client. So it has to, you have to be very careful about how you build it, where the pressure points are and so forth. And um, so it, it's, it's important from that perspective that it, it is comfortable. It also needs to stay on the patient's residual limb. It needs to remain uh, affixed to the stump. So it cannot pull away from the, the stump when the person walks. Uh, that's a very important part of it that, that it is not falling off. And then finally, if you think about a device, you know, having some dimension and coming close uh, on a stump, to a knee, for example, a knee joint, it has to make you have to make sure that there's freedom of motion in the the knee uh, after you apply a prosthetic on the patient, so that they don't uh, lose the functionality of the, the the body part that they have, actually have to to work with. All right. So, how are these devices normally made? So typically, it's it's a it's a manual process. It's it's quite involved. It takes a a, a long period of time. It involves plaster casting of a patient's, I keep talking about residual limb here, we, you know, the general broad space of prosthetics and orthotics. I'm, I'm concentrating on what we do work on, which is prosthetics and typically below the knee. So these photos that I'm showing in this, in this slide show a device being built for, for someone below, below the knee, and it's a, it's a replacement. Mm -hmm. So the process is a manual process. It involves plaster casting, which can be messy time consuming from the point of view that it involves a lot of hands-on work. It involves uh, setting of the, the casting material. Um, it has to set before it can move on to the next step and so forth. It involves a number of steps. So in the slides, you can see that the cast is applied kind of in the conventional sense as someone would have a cast put on a, on a broken arm. It then is removed from the patient's residual limb. That's what we call a negative cast. Uh, it is then filled with additional casting material, 
and uh, we create a what is referred to as a positive cast. You can see a positive cast in this slide here. Mm -hmm. uh, they, the clinicians do some work on that, adding material, subtracting material based on the type of performance or relief of pressure points or um, providing space in the device that they ultimately create. So the, this is what we call rectification. And then they, they laminate that plaster cast, the one that is a, you know, essentially a replica made of the patient's residual limb using casting material. They laminate that with a uh, polypropylene material, which then becomes the part of the, the socket or part of the prosthetic device, which is the socket. That process can take up to a week to make. Uh, a lot of people involved in the process, so it's it's time-consuming, messy process. And for the most part, it you know it creates a lot of mess at the end. It, a lot of things are discarded at the end and uh, cannot be reused. Wow. So yeah. So this this process seems like you mentioned very time-consuming. Uses a lot of materials that are sort of wasted at the end. Uh, takes a lot of time in terms of like labor involved and expertise. So to sort of peeking at the future, in what sort of ways can 3D scanning, 3D design, and 3D printing help people who need prosthetic devices? Right. Well, what we're talking about here is moving from kind of the, the analog world, you know, the traditional model to a, a more of a digital model. And we've seen that happen in, in different uh, contexts. So we've seen that happen with photography. We've seen that happen with telecommunications and phones and things like that. Mm -hmm. This is what we're doing in the prosthetics and orthotics world. So the process involves, uh, and we call this process, by the way, 3D printability. We've created a tool chain that uh, encompasses those three elements that you talked about. So scanning, instead of creating that casting material, um, instead of creating that mold using a cast, we do that in the digital world by scanning a patient's residual limb. Uh, we then do modeling, uh, or what I refer to as rectification, by adding or subtracting material to that model that, that is the basis for creating a prosthetic uh, socket at the end of it. Mm -hmm. And then um, we, we hand that off to a 3D printer to actually print the, the portion, the custom portion of the prosthetic device, this socket. And that, of course, is, as I say, you know, very custom, very specific to the individual. It has to be comfortable and it has to you know, provide that mobility to the client. Great. So, yeah. so how does this process sort of compare in terms of like time and cost, broadly speaking, to the other, uh, so the more traditional method of making a, a prosthetic device? Yeah, so a, the traditional method is it can take up to a week, as I, as I mentioned, to produce a device. So it involves a lot of casting of material, it involves uh, drying of material, it involves a lot of hands-on work, a lot, a lot of modifications and, and so forth, and then uh, ultimately draping of, of material at the end. So we do the same thing in the digital world, you know, preserving some of those concepts, but we use scanners, uh, we use uh, computer software to do modeling. And, and that alone, those two, two bits of scanning and modeling can, done, can be done in about an hour as compared to something that would take normally two or three days. And then the, the, that information is passed off to a 3D printer, um, which is effectively a, you know, a robot or a machine that does the 3D printing and does not involve any kind of hands-on by the clinician. So we estimate that there is a productivity increase of about 500%. And through some of our studies, we've seen that uh, the cost uh, reduction to producing a device using a digital tool chain can be in the order of about 20%. So to sort of expand on what that means, right? That would mean that a person who would normally be able to make one device in a certain amount of time uh, would, able to, would be able to produce five devices with the same sort of amount of time or resources. So that's what you mean by like product, production efficiency increasing by 500%, right? That's exactly right. So it, once again, going back to these photos, you can see that a lot of it gets done digitally, it gets done on the computer, and then you hand it off to this uh, 3D printer to do the printing. And at that point, it's, it's hands off. If effectively, you could multiply the number of printers you, you actually have in the workshop. You can actually potentially increase beyond 
uh, efficiency, in increases in efficiency. So it's a, it, the handing it off to a machine to do um, enables us to uh, free the time of the practitioner to do to provide healthcare to to other individuals. One of the other things that we do, because we, we can do these things digitally, we can, we can save this information so you don't have that same kind of waste. And we are working on other systems that are, we can do actually using virtual reality. So this is something that we're doing in testing right now. So once it becomes digital, there are various ways in which to interact with the digital information and, and to ultimately produce that device. Wow. Well, so yeah, so, so that's like really incredible work. Um, but you mentioned this technology, right? A 3D printer. What exactly is a 3D printer? And like you have on your slide, how is it used to make a prosthetic device? Right, a 3D printer is um, sometimes referred to as a fused deposition modeling uh, device. There are various types of 3D printers, but the, the one that we use is, is this type of FDM, fused deposition modeling printer. And what it does is it layers material on a print bed. And it, you can kind of think of it as a glue gun running around that's being moved around by a kind of a robotic armature and laying down successive layers of material to produce a three-dimensional object. And so we build this object digitally in, in the CAD software that we've evolved. And then uh, we're here using a 3D printer and use a, a time-lapse photography or video of how it works. So this is a time-lapse uh, video. How long would this normally take to produce? Like at like normal uh, speed? Yeah, it depends on the size of, of the prosthetic device, but uh, typically we've, we've, we're have we seeing uh, devices like this produced anywhere from four to seven hours. Wow, so that's pretty rapid. So we, it is it is pretty good when you consider, uh, you know, the alternative, doing it all manually. And it is really um, something that can be replicated many times. As I mentioned, if you if you think about producing a device uh, digitally uh, and then modeling in, in about an hour's time frame, if you have a, you know, a series of printers, you could hand that off to a bunch of printers and be producing devices ongoing, uh, like in a factory kind of idea. Yeah, so what sort of materials are you able to print with these printers and which, I guess, uh, what are sort of the most appropriate ones for creating a prosthetic socket in this case? Kind of depends on who we're talking about, you know, which which uh, region we're talking about that is making the device. So we we find that in high income countries they use this material called PETG and PLA. Uh, in low income countries, and what we do is we we work with either um, nylon or polypropylene, mm -hmm. and our favorite material uh, choice is polypropylene actually. You know, and and one of the reasons why we do that is because polypropylene is the the material that is used in the orthopedic workshop already in these low-income country settings. So working with polypropylene um, in the 3D printer and being able to, for example, weld things together, or glue things together, they already have some of the some of the tools at hand in the in the workshop. So it makes it as a, a good good material for this use. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I think I've also heard that sometimes uh, heat guns are used to do some like final deformation of the print afterwards if fits aren't quite just so. Uh, and it's easier to do with uh, the fact that you're using polypropylene as the material because it can sort of uh, deform after it's sort of been set. Yeah, so final adjustments are possible. Um, we print the material, uh, we, we print the device as a solid. Um, mm -hmm. Perhaps getting a little too technical here, but because it's solid wall, uh, you can heat up the wall and you can, you can think of it as kind of punching out a, a part of the socket to allow for some sort of uh, additional space that the client might need, or you can kind of pinch things. Once they're heated up, you can manipulate it. So we, we think that you can do about 10 to 15% additional manipulation after you've printed the device. So yeah. That's fantastic. So I, you know, Saul, so I was thinking that this might be a, a good time to show you how all of this comes together. I've got a little video clip here. As part of the work that we've done, we've done a lot of uh, clinical studies to, you know, make sure that what we are doing is is effective, it is safe, it is it actually 
uh, fits the patient and is functional and uh, you know will not harm patients. So we've done a number of clinical studies. And this is what I'm about to show you is a, a little video of a clinical study that we did in uh, at a hospital called Korsu in Uganda. And one of the, the little girl that is profiled in this, uh, she was actually our very first patient ever to enter into the program. Her name is Rosalind. She, at the time, she was four years old. She drove 35 hours. She came 35 hours with her brother, Silas, 12-year-old brother. Could not come with the parents because the, there's, they're of a family of 10 kids. And so the parents had to tend to the farm and tend to the other kids. So they sent their 12-year-old son with uh, Rosalind to come to Corsa Hospital where she received uh, the very first prosthetics that she ever had in her life. So you'll see her walking for the very first time in her life in this video. She was born and the leg was missing, the right feet, she was missing. It was very difficult for her to walk, to play also with the other children. She can be lonely, but when she was given the leg, she was able to run with others, play with others. When we give a child a prosthetic limb, we're allowing them to walk, we're allowing them to go to school, and we're allowing them to participate in their family and community lives. There's thousands of children in Uganda in need of prosthetic devices. In a place like Uganda, there's a huge lack of prosthetists. In fact, we believe there's probably 12 prosthetists to serve the entire country. For over the past decade, we have known that there's a shortage of 40,000 prosthetic technicians. It would take another 50 years just to train 18,000 more. For Korsu Hospital, one of the challenges we have is the length of time it takes a technician to produce a prosthetic device. It's a long procedure, custom feeling, modification, uh, molding. For it, you have to really concentrate. Given the fact that the manual process of creating a prosthetic takes up to a week, that means that each prosthetist is taking one week to build a prosthetic. That means there's about 12 prosthetics being made potentially per uh, week uh, in Uganda, in the entire country. And we wanted to see if it was possible to speed that process up using 3D scanning and printing technologies. We've basically created a process which mirrors, in many cases, the, the manual process, just in a digital environment instead of in a manual environment. Instead of plaster casting, we use a 3D scanner to capture the external shape of that residual limb. Instead of rectifying that shape by adding or subtracting plaster, we use 3D modeling software to basically add or subtract those materials. And instead of wrapping it in polypropylene in kind of physical world, we do something very similar in the digital context, wrapping that shape to create a socket model, which we then print on a 3D printer. So we've tried to kind of parallel or conserve aspects of that manual process uh, into the digital process to also facilitate the transfer of knowledge and the growing expertise of prosthetists that are already skilled. It's a tough learning curve, actually, because you're learning a lot of new skills about how to operate in digital space. They are teaching you to make your work easier. Like, you take short time doing your work now. It's like you're developing from what you already know to another stage. With this method, we could easily save 80% of the time in producing a device that would 
mean that although there's a shortage of technicians in Uganda, at least for the technicians we have, we can use them more efficiently. Imagine that a patient who needs a socket, rather than spending a whole week here, they may only have to spend one day here. This technology also is good. I know it can help my sister when she has grown. faster and more comfortable and fitting on the body. When you're moving, just move freely. Yeah, without any problem. Corsu Hospital, the University of Toronto, Autodesk Research and CBM Canada have all brought unique skills and expertise to be able to produce a prosthetic limb for a child. Bringing those different groups together it increases our capacity to truly intervene in these, you know, what we might call real wicked problems in society. Great. Well, thank you so much for sharing your screen, Tito. Um, and thank you all to or for your excellent questions in the chat. Uh, we've got a couple more minutes left in this session, and so if you want to, you could keep posting in the chat and I can answer them live, uh, or you could ask your questions and I can sort of answer them sort of more conversationally. Um, yeah, what do you guys think of the video? Do you have any questions about anything that came up in that video? You can unmute yourself. That's fine. If not, which is totally fine, I think a lot of you got great uh, questions out in the chat, so I totally understand if you're all questioned out. Um, but thank you so much for your time and for your engagement in this session. Uh, it was really fun interviewing Jerry and really great to see your interest and in answering your questions. Uh, so I hope you guys had a good time and thank you so much. Oh, I'm... Yeah, so I was about to say, so you just yeah. got one last minute question. Yeah, one last minute question. So the question is from Elise. When an amputee grows, do they need to be refitted for a brand new prosthetic or can they modify their existing, their pre-existing prosthetic? So that is a great question. Um, the part that interfaces with their body, the socket, definitely needs to be replaced when they grow. And in fact, for children, often they have to change their prosthetic socket as often as you would have to change your shoes when you grow. So maybe once or twice a year. Uh, depending on how much they've grown, sometimes they need to change other parts of the prosthetic, right? So if you were born without a leg and you use a prosthetic device, then you would eventually have to change out the, the part of your prosthetic device that acts as the foot as you grow. But it's really up to the, the person and their prosthetist, the person who helps them, the clinician who helps them fit with the device. Um, but yeah, in general, you have to replace different uh, different parts where the part that interfaces with your body is the part that changes the most. And then the rest of it sometimes can stay for multiple uh, iterations of that prosthetic process. And then I see another one. How does the prosthetic limb attach to the patient? Yeah, so that's a great question. So the, the parts that are 3D printed or the, the part that was 3D printed in that video, that time lapse video that takes four to seven hours, that's called the prosthetic socket. And so the patient for a lower limb prosthetic uh, device will wear basically a sock over their residual limb. And then this socket will slide over their residual limb that has a sock on it and sort of fit really snugly with the device. Um, so it's kind of like putting on a shoe, but it sort of fits around your residual limb. I hope that answers your question, Cameron. Great. Well, this was super exciting. I hope you guys also had a nice time. Uh, and that's all for me. And any more, any more questions you can send to that email and I'll try to get back to you. But I, I will get back to you. I won't try. I will get back to you.